my name is Gary Rumbles and I'm a research fellow at the National Renewable Energy Lab and I also hold an adjoint professor position at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. My projects are uh, they're funded by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and we get to work on some of the more fundamental aspects of renewable energy, or renewable energy in my case. Um, I, I work with the uh, solar photochemistry program in the Department of Energy where we're interested in fundamental processes of how you absorb light, photons of light from the sun uh, and turn them into electrons and holes for doing useful work I think is probably a good summary. And my own research is very much focused on understanding how in organic polymers we actually generate charges. It's a bit of a mystery at the moment as to how that actually happens. It's very different from conventional uh, solar energy materials that, that, that you're more familiar with. But the current state of, of the art in organic, what we call organic photovoltaic, sometimes it's called exotonic solar cells. That's more of a, a general uh, umbrella that covers a number of different technologies. But organic photovoltaics is the most prominent one. Um, and we've seen device performance really uh, significantly improve over the last four or five, probably six years now. Back in 2001 we were working around two and a half percent and the current state of the art is, is over 10 percent which is quite a significant improvement in such a short period of time. The, the interesting thing is it's been accomplished not by optimizing or engineering one particular system such as silicon for example, they've never really changed the active component whereas in the organic arena we keep changing the, the chemical systems that we use. We change all the components in the active material. Uh, that's both an asset because it means we can do it, we can optimize the system to be a better performing system, but it makes a little bit of a problem for companies who wish to take that technology on because they never know which material we ought to be working with. They, they simply look at it and say, shall we take this one or shall we take the next one? And we always say, you should take the next one, it'll be much better. <laughs> Over the last 20 years, we've learned a lot about how to control the electronic properties of uh, condensed phase polymers and, and molecules. And it's that understanding that enables us to make uh, decisions about how, we, how the next molecule is made and synthesized. And we rely heavily on what the chemists can actually do. We, Frequently we can write something down on a piece of paper which is very, very easy to draw uh, but nearly impossible for some poor chemist to actually synthesize. And it's our role is to work with the chemists to help them understand the, the properties of the materials that they've made so that they can make better decisions or more informed decisions on the next series of polymers or molecules that they make. So I'm very much an admirer of what the organic and inorganic chemists can do. They can they do some really very, very elegant science. And so I, I used to refer to the, this field of science in, in the chemistry arena as molecular engineering. Uh, and I had a colleague once refer, say, I prefer to do molecular fine arts. But the, the point being that the, the molecular engineering has, a, has an applied bias to it. But that's how I look at it, is they're engineering molecules to have specific properties and properties that we can exploit in the solar energy arena. It's quite, it's quite interesting that, that if you asked most people in the field how charges are generated, they will give you exactly the same explanation as the person sitting next to them. And I have, I've kind of gone rogue recently, especially since about last June. Um, I'm starting to uh, propose a different mechanism by which charges are produced. And I'm using a, a model inspired from natural photosynthesis in the uh, the reaction center, the photosynthetic reaction center, learning how that does it and then applying the knowledge from that in the organic arena. But I'm, I, there's one or two of us that are kind of pushing this. Um, Alessandra Twaisi from University of Warwick has a similar idea as well. But generally um, it's, it's quite a mystery as to how this actually happens. And I think until we can actually understand how we produce these charges, uh, we're going to struggle to actually move forward with our, with our technology. So it's a very, very important question to answer. The, the people that work at NREL um, have a, a common bond, and that common bond is that we truly believe in the mission of the laboratory. And so whilst our research, we like to think is, in my particular area, is um, comparable to what a university science department would do, 
uh, we always constrain ourselves to work on things that we truly believe will address renewable energy. So we, we're unable to, or we don't choose to work on projects that, that don't address that, that basic problem, the basic mission of the laboratory.